Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to Triple N Media I am Dr Nick Nickam and this is cardiology lecture series and all our programs are video stream through YouTube and please please do subscribe to our YouTube channel now the feature presentation Hello ladies and gentlemen I am Dr Nick Nickam Welcome to ACLS Symptomatic Tachycardia Algorithm. Let us say you have been called by the telemetry officer to check on a patient on the floor who is having a heart rate of 160 to 180 per minute. As soon as you walk into the room, you want to do an overall assessment of the patient. Is the patient alert? Is the patient confused? Does the patient have hypotension? Is the patient in shock? Is the patient sweating? Is the patient complaining of chest pain? Is the patient in acute heart failure? These symptoms will tell us the effects of tachycardia on the patient. We need to immediately put this patient on cardiac monitor, get the blood pressure, get an electrocardiogram to look at the rhythm, give some oxygen, start an IV, get pulse oximeter, and make sure the airway is adequate. Once we have done this, now you look at the 12 lead electrocardiogram. As soon as you get a 12 lead EKG or get a rhythm strip on the monitor, look for the QRS complex. If the QRS complex is narrow, then we have a different path. If the QRS complex is wide like this, if the QRS complex is wide, then we're going to follow this pathway. So let's look at the narrow QRS complex. What are the conditions that cause narrow QRS complex tachycardia? Most frequently, we see atrial flutter with rapid ventricular response, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, or it could be atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. So these are the rhythms that present as narrow QRS tachycardia. On the other hand, when you see a wide QRS tachycardia, it could be ventricular in origin or it, it could be supraventricular in origin with uh, ventricular aberration or bundle branch block. That's why a 12 lead electrocardiogram will help you to understand the rhythm a little better. If the patient has an underlying left bundle branch block, obviously the supraventricular tachycardia may also present with a wide QRS complex. Once you have ascertained as to whether the QRS complex is narrow or the QRS complex is wide, then we're going to follow that particular protocol which is appropriate for a narrow QRS complex. Now we are talking about patients who are symptomatic, who need immediate attention. All right. If the patient has symptoms, the best approach would be to sedate this patient and do cardioversion using 50 to 100 joules biphasic because time is of the essence. Since this patient is having symptoms, since this patient is having rapid supraventricular tachycardia, cardioversion is the best option and then once you do the cardioversion, you can look at the underlying rhythm and decide what other things need to be done. On the other hand, if the patient has no symptoms, then we have time to get the IV access, analyze the 12 lead electrocardiogram, follow Wegel maneuvers to slow the heart rate to find out what is the underlying atrial rhythm. Is this atrial fibrillation? Is it atrial flutter? Is it paroxysmal atrial tachycardia? Or is it junctional tachycardia? If this is a supraventricular tachycardia, which is regular, it is most often amenable to adenosine, which is given 6 milligrams IV as a bolus, followed with a ml of saline flush. And if that doesn't work in 3 to 5 minutes, try 12 milligrams of adenosine. If adenosine doesn't work, we have other options such as beta blockers. You could use metaprolol or low pressure, 5 milligrams IV as a bolus. And we can repeat this every 5 to 10 minutes as needed to bring the heart rate down. 
if we are dealing with the chronic atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response and the patient is slightly unstable we can consider cardiogen but we have to understand if the patient is hypotensive cardiogen can make the blood pressure worse so expanding the intravascular volume and then car giving cardiogen would be a more appropriate step than just giving cardiogen in a hypotensive patient as such and if the cardiogen has a good response then we can start the patient on a continuous drip if things don't improve move the patient to the intensive care unit and consider expert consultation all right now let's look at the other side here we we'll look at the wide qrs tachycardia as i told you earlier the wild qrs tachycardia could be ventricular in origin or it could be supraventricular with a bundle branch block or an aberration so once you have identified a wild qrs tachycardia if the patient is having symptoms there is only one answer and that is sedation and cardioversion you sedate the patient the standard dose for uh, ventricular tachycardia is 100 to 200 watts biphasic defibrillation if the cardioversion doesn't work and if the patient goes into ventricular fibrillation we can immediately defibrillate the patient using 200 joules energy if the patient has no symptoms if the patient has sustained tachycardia but is stable then we have time to get some iv access and after you analyze the 12 lead electrocardiogram you can attempt a vagal maneuver to at least slow down the rate to see if we can recognize identifiable p waves which will tell you or give you which will give you a clue that you may be dealing with a supraventricular rhythm with uh, aberration and then based on the morphology of p waves you can determine the exact treatment if it's atrial flutter or if it's a pat you may be able to use adenosine 6 to 12 mg iv as a bolus followed by 20 ml of saline flush if that doesn't work if the qrs complex is most likely from a ventricular origin we can try amiodarone 150 mg bolus followed by an infusion at 1 mg per minute we can also try procainamide especially useful in patients with supraventricular tachycardia with aberration who may invariably have accessory pathway and in those situations a procainamide does work and you start off with 25 to 50 mg iv per minute over 10 minutes and if there is good response then we can start them on intravenous infusion at 1 to 4 mg per minute so ladies and gentlemen this is in a nutshell how you approach a patient who is having a symptomatic uh, tachycardia this is a much more clinical approach that's that's why i started off at uh, bedside in a real patient situation so that we are not only treating the symptomatic tachycardia but we are treating the patient any time we use these vasodilators or drugs that reduce the heart rate or blood pressure we want to make sure that we expand their intravascular volume with uh, normal saline so that we maintain the blood pressure we can also elevate the legs to increase the venous return to the heart so that we will be able to manage the complete patient not just the tachycardia so i hope this presentation has been helpful for you to decide at bedside how you approach a patient with symptomatic or asymptomatic tachycardia thank you so much for watching i am dr nick nikam thank you so much for watching our program and please do subscribe to our youtube channel If you would like to support this program you can look for the dollar sign on the right hand side of your browser and support in any way you possibly can again thank you so much for watching this presentation and until next time i am dr nick nikam